at Sundays on Mondays right here at CornerstoneGlobal.tv. Thank you for watching and letting other people know about it. And one of the things I love to do is to take you to different locations and I love to help expose the body of Christ one to another to see what other people are doing in locations maybe different from your own, but also hearing the same sound and expressing the same kingdom message as you are. So I'm going into an interview today where I was in Philadelphia and uh, Kathy and I had a chance to go there and be with some wonderful people at In The Light Church. And uh, one day we did like a little question and answer and I think you'll enjoy it. Here we go. Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, when you, when you said uh, last evening by way of introduction that, uh, that you have like a thousand questions, mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, but we don't endure that at all. I really enjoy it. Mm, good. And um, I get more nervous when I'm around people that don't have any questions. Right. When people, it's one thing not to know something. It's another thing when you don't know that you don't know something. That's right. You know, yeah. and so, um, so I like curious minds and, and the fact that you're that kind of a leader that's not just doing what you do, but want to know how things work right. and the inner workings and how other people do what they do. That's a good thing to have in a leader. You know, it's going to, it's going to keep everybody sharp. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah, I, I appreciate I, it. I was going to say that last night. Like, it's not, we're not enduring it at all. We enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I do believe between um, understanding and ignorance is uh, just a question away. Mm. And some people are not, they're ignorant to something because they're not asking the right question. And, and the idea is to keep going after something until you get insight or revelation into that thing that you might not be aware of. And so I think uh, we're trying to have a breeding ground where it's the same case for all of us here, is that you grow in your leadership, not by always having the, all the answers, but sometimes just having a bunch of the right questions. The arrival of a question means that the answer has already been released somewhere, because you can't have a question unless there's an answer. So the question to me is not why do the four lepers have a question? Mm -hmm. Their question is why sit we here until we die? Right. But they had been sitting there dying for a long time. The question really is why does that question happen now? Mm, yeah. The reason they have the question now is because just a little bit ago, the prophet released an answer that this time tomorrow, this famine is going to be over. So now the arrival of that question in their own spirit why sit we here until we die, pushes them towards the prophetic answer that yeah. has already been released. So everything moves on the point of a question. The questions that you ask would determine the direction you go. All of civilization of man moved based on the changing of the question. Mm -hmm. When the question was, how do we get to water? That, that built a nomadic society. When the question changed to how do we get the water to us, yeah. then we started building cities. Because we, did, we didn't have to move towards water. So it's important, the questions that you have. Yeah, yeah, and the answer's already there. It's and already the question there. kind of draws that answer draws towards you. That's so good. We already started. You guys woke up yet? He's had, he's had his coffee. So yeah, hopefully you had yours. We already started. So that's what we're going to do. We're, we're just going to get into this time. I'm going to ask some questions, and I'm just going to release them. I feel like I'm just the point guard giving some alley-oops. I'm just going to alley-oop him, and he's going to bam. He's gonna dunk it. I'm going to throw something in this direction, and I'm just going to have fun with it. And uh, again, I believe this is going to be something that many, many other leaders and people will enjoy to hear. Some of this content, some of this insights that we're sharing. I was going to take time to ask you to kind of um, form some questions. We didn't have time to do that. Hopefully, I, I'm able to capture some things, and I believe, regardless, we're going to get some good things um, out of this time. And so, uh, especially because we are so interested in building a structure and a culture at a church that is healthy. And, and we're always evolving, we're always growing in the generations and the time. Just like he talked about last night, such a progression in things. That if we, if we end up feeling like we've arrived, what we'll do is we'll bring structures around tradition. Yes. And we'll protect tradition instead of established progression and next thing you know we need an upgrade or we find ourselves just kind of depleting or falling behind in the times because I think everything that God does and if he, he has a, a now word and after that word there's something else that will move us forward into the next thing and it's from, so it's from glory to glory it's just not that glory it's a, another glory that he wants to set us up for and so that's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna ask and I'm gonna turn them loose and and we're just gonna enjoy this time so 
we were talking a, a little bit about this, Bishop, um, just uh, about managers versus uh, leaders. There's people that will just manage something, and there's people that we've, you've identified as leaders. And so some of those differences are some of the things we talked about. I want you to speak into that. You've actually um, even thought of them in terms of A-teams. Like, yeah. this is my A-team, yeah. and so they're not just managers. Right. In, other, in other words, they're just not just sitting there and letting something just happen and always have to come to you yeah. uh, for, for answers. Uh, when you see that, you're like, that's not an A-team mindset. That's not a leadership mindset. That's a manager. Yeah. So speak into just what well, you, if you think do, about it. If, if I do it in biblical terms, and then I'll, I'll kind of take it away from there, because um, sometimes if we just talk out, outside of the Bible, people don't hear it or see it the same way. Um, sometimes in church world, the term faithfulness is defined by doing something that doesn't work for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so someone has like a prayer group, and they've got 10 people in it, and they say, Brother so-and-so is so faithful, he's prayed with those same 10 guys for 10 years. Well, the Bible doesn't call that faithfulness because the Bible calls that unfaithfulness and wickedness mm. if you read the parable of the talents. If you return something to God in the same measure he gave it to you in, right. then you are a wicked servant. Mm -hmm. So faithfulness is not doing something that doesn't work for a long time. That's managing or maintaining. So in the parable of the talents, he said, he said, well, you know, you're an austere man. And so I, look, I gave back to you exactly what you gave to me. Right. And he said, you wicked servant, did you not know that I expected you to take what I gave you and make it fruitful? Yeah. So a, a manager, uh, someone who's managing something is, is maintaining it. Moses has a ministry of maintenance. If, you know, the Moses mentality is I'm going to keep you alive, keep you in shoes, keep you in clothes, and every day I got to keep providing manna. Every day we're going to do the same thing. Every day is water from a rock. Every day is this. Every day is that. So it's, it's a maintenance ministry. Yeah. So uh, to me, an A team or a leader is someone who, can, who, can, who is self motivated. Yeah. I don't have to stand over you. If you're only doing right while I'm looking at you, I don't need you. Right. So. So you have to have someone who is self-motivated, someone who can take something and do it better than what I could do it right. in, in our church structure. Because I, I, I can be an ideas guy or come up with a plan, but if, I'm the, if I can do it better than you can, then, then you're obsolete. Right. I need you to take it and then do it better. Right. And, then, and then you move from uh, gifting to capacity. Because th this, this is a shift, I think, that's maybe important for, for this set of leaders right here. Because when, from, from, from inception to where you guys are at, one of the things that, that the senior leaders do is they, you have to pull people that have giftings. Because we need gifted people to do, to do art, to do lights, to do sound, to do music, to, to help with children. And people have gifts. Then at a certain level, I need, I need people around me that have capacity. Because it's one thing to be able to sing. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to be able to build a music department. That's good, yeah. And I know some people can sing that paint off the wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they can't build a department right. because they don't have people skills. They don't have organizational skills. They don't know how to include other people. They had to be the big star. Right. They, had to, they come late for rehearsal. Right. And when, they, when, we put, so when we put them up, they can sing, but they can't build a department. I know people that love kids. They could have wrote the stuff for Sesame Street, mm -hmm. and they could have played Big Bird and all that. Mm -hmm. You put them in a cardboard box in a room with a bunch of kids, and they can entertain kids, but they can't build a children's department. That's good, yeah. So, so they have a gift, but they don't have capacity. Mm -hmm. And so it's not always their fault or whatever, but the point is um, I need people with capacity yeah. that are yeah. around me to help me build, not just to do. Right, and... Um, the, the story that you shared at one of uh, your, uh, your preachings was that your spiritual father, late spiritual father, um, Lester Summerall, uh, when you were about to move into your current Cornerstone building, yeah. uh, he looked around and you said, he said, see me tonight. Yeah. And so you went over there tonight, uh, that night to his hotel room, yep. and the words he spoke to you, uh, if I'm quoting this right, is, amateur hour is over. Yes. What did he mean by that? Well, I thought we were, I thought we were awesome. <laughs> and, you know, at whatever level that you're at, you think you're awesome. 
until you get to the next level. It's kind of like looking at like your style, you know, like you look at pictures and you think like, you know, at the moment, you think think like, that's great. And then like Uh five years from then, 10 years, and then you look back at that picture and you go like, what was I thinking about? (laughs) But, you know, when it was happening, you were awesome, you know? You think I'm going to feel that way about this jack, this, this shirt right here? You well, said it looked like a straight jacket. Well, I just like, told him, I said, it modified. looks like they modified straight jacket there when they let you out. But it's, it's cool. I'm going to be like, what was I thinking? I'm, ha- I'm happy with it, you know? <laughs> Do your thing, brother. Yeah, Do yeah, your yeah. thing. <laughs> you know? But you will look back at that next week and go, like, what was I thinking yeah, about? Yeah. Dang, just next week, not even a year from now. <laughs> No, it's all good. But, yeah, you know, yeah. Woo. Um, yeah, but, you know, so, so at that season, we thought we were awesome because, you know, we, uh, Kathy and I both grew up in small classical Pentecostal churches. And the church I grew up in had roughly like 100, 120, they might hit 150 on a, on a big thing. Mm-hmm. And so by the time we were 23, 23 years old, we were pastoring the largest church we'd ever been a part of. Mm. And um, so, you know, so we were just kind of finding our way. So, you know, in, in, in the, the, the group that we grew up in, one of their largest churches in the entire state, I think, had 300 people or 400 people, something like that. Wow. And so, um, so, you know, comparatively speaking, we were awesome. <laughs> and, uh, and so we thought we were doing good and we were making some progress. And um, so Dr. Summerall had come and he was walking through there and, and he, he, he's, he says, uh, when you get done with your new building, amateur hour is over. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, so I just wrote it down. You know, it was like, it was like ouch, but I'm, I'm just writing, amateur hour is over. So I went back and I told our team, amateur hour is over. So Dr. Stonewall started saying, if it's, if, it's not, if it's not excellent, and excellence is not just a performance. Excellence yes. is a spirit. That's good. Daniel had an excellent spirit. You can't because some people try to buy their way into excellence. Mm. You know, so excellence is not always having the best stuff. It's doing the best you can with what you have at the time. That's good. And doing it with the right spirit. And if you do it with the right spirit and an excellent spirit, I would rather go, you know, t- to a church that may not have what a lot of people would say are excellent facilities, mm-hmm. but they've done, they've done excellent with what God gave them. Yeah. And the spirit is excellent, right. you know, has to be in something that's, that's, that's not done that way. So I'm not just talking about performance, but, but I'm talking about the spirit of everything. So, so that's what we did. We started realizing, you know, he was like, if it's, not, if it's not proper, you know, if a person can't do it, it's time to get the amateurs out of the way. And what that became to us is, is removing people or, or, or encouraging them to grow, those that considered what we were doing a hobby. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so... You know, serving God and working in the church ministry was to some people a hobby. Hmm. And um, I got football season, I got baseball season, I go to the gym, and I volunteer in the children's ministry. Well, to us, this, this is not a hobby. We had to start getting people around us that felt called, that felt called to do this. This is this, because your blessing is in your place. And so if, if, if God has, if your place is driving a church bus, your blessing is waiting for you on that church bus. That's good. And as long as you're trying to get behind the pulpit, you're going to miss your blessing because God put your blessing where he called you. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll be more blessed driving the church bus than you would be up behind the pulpit. Your wife is waiting for you somewhere connected to that bus. I don't know where she's getting on that bus, whether you're going to pick her up or you're going to hit her car with that bus and meet her at an accident. I don't know how, but, but, but the wife, the spouse that God has for yeah. you is somehow connected to you being in that bus. That's good. That's good. Amateur hour is over. Amateur hour is over. <laughs> and, and, it's, and, and, and a lot of times it's just raising our game. Yeah. It's just saying, how can we do what we do at the, at the next level? Do people take that? And, and, and yeah. does some run with it and some maybe got kind of weeded out and others yeah. were like, no, that's, I'm, that's I'm with step everything. Up. I don't, I, you, I, that's with everything. Mm-hmm. No, matter, no matter what level you're at or what you're teaching, the, the house of God, Bethel, with a ladder, there's always angels ascending and descending. Yeah. At any yeah. given time in our ministry, some people are going up and some people are going down. Some people are going up, some people are going down. Different seasons, different times. 
there was a, it was a guy that I knew, and, and he had a church, and they decided they were going to re redo everything. And, and they wanted to make it actually a bit more like this, and they painted all of their walls black so they could get more, more control over the, the lighting and yeah. things and, and decorate it. Anyway, whatever it was, they just decided to paint it black. And so he had one of his members come to him and says, you know, I've never been to a church with black walls, and if, if we don't do something about these walls, I'm leaving. So, which is kind of an odd thing, but mm -hmm. that's how people are. It's like, you know, you painted the walls. So, so the pastor said, the pastor said, I'm going to pray with you because I think that you should go. <laughs> you know, because, because, I mean, if you're going to leave over what color we painted the walls, there's, you know, that's, your commitment is so deep. But he, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he says, he says, but what I want to do is pray with you that God will send you to a church that never changes the colors of their walls. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like are you going to walk in day number one you know and say this right. is what I can do so no matter what you do if, if change and progression is not a part of the fabric of who you are somewhere along the line people will stop walking with you yeah. that's, that's what I mean when I talk about capacity yeah. do you have the capacity to grow do you have the capacity to, ch to grow with me to change with me to, to walk into new truth with me, to experiment with me, to let me try something new, to, le to let us hear a fresh word and then try to figure out how, how do we then flesh out and articulate and demonstrate what God is saying to us. And we don't always get it right the first time. Right. You know, the oxen sometimes stumbles, yeah. you know, and the ark moves, but I don't need you putting your hand on it. Because sometimes we look unstable when we're in transition as if we don't know what we're doing. Mm. And the reason for that is because we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> you know, we, we've never been that way before. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we're walking it out with you. And God says, well, do this, you know, and you hear a word. So uh, when we were at a particular level in our church, I, I distinctly remember hearing this word come to me. Um, it, it went like this. I want to hear a unique and distinct sound coming from this house to me in praise and worship. When I hear you singing, I want to know it's you singing. Mm. That's what I heard. Okay. That, and you know how God, God just drops something on you, but doesn't give you the whole thing. Right. So the only thing I know to do, so I went to our team at the time, musicians and psalmists and writers and choir and everybody, and I had a meeting with them. And I said, um, I said, I heard the Lord say he wants a unique and distinct sound coming from this house to him in worship that when we are singing and worshiping, he wants to know it's us. Because that's all he told me. Yeah, yeah. So they were looking at me like, Ann. <laughs> and I'm like, Ann. <laughs> right? So I'm like, let's figure it out. Yeah. So, so um, <laughs> this was one of those interesting seasons in our church because... Because I, I came in on a Sunday, and they were, and they, you know, they were trying, mm -hmm. you know, and I got up, and I just, after like a song or two, and I said, nope, that's not it. That's not the sound. And uh, God bless you. Thank you. And I would just go on preaching. I wasn't mad. I wasn't upset. But I just, you know, when I'm done with something, I'm just done with it, you know. So I was just done, you know. I said, that's not it. And um, so, so then we just went on, and I would teach. I was, so I'm preaching and teaching because I call that walking towards revelation when I'm preaching. You, sometimes you just keep walking towards revelation. It gets clearer as you keep moving towards it. Yeah. So I just kept preaching about it and worship and praise and the sound. And I just kept going. And then they would come in. They would try something else. And the next Sunday I said, no, that's not it. You know, just stop. And um, so I did that. I don't know how, how many weeks that was. And um, so what I found out later was that one, one Sunday I was in my office and they were singing something. And I was in my office, but I could hear it because our building was really small and all that. Mm -hmm. And I could hear it. And something in me like stood up. I said, that's, and I went running out there into the service. And they thought like, oh Lord, here we go again. You know, we get ready to get sit down. And I stopped because I said, stop, stop. That's it. Whatever you just did, that's it. And what I found out later was they had written that song that week in rehearsal. Because they got in there and somebody said, well, I've been working on a song. And the minister of music said, well, we can't do nothing but get set down. And we've been set down for four or five weeks. So let's give it a go. But that started a process with us. And, and so what my point is, 
I wasn't upset with them. They weren't upset with me. We're, t- we're trying to figure out that revelation. If you're the kind of person like, well, I'm not going to sing up here and him set me down every week. Well, you don't have the capacity mm. then, then to walk with, because this is not star search. This ain't about you getting, you know, that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to find what God is saying to us. Yeah. And that works through all of our areas. Sometimes it's practical things. Sometimes it's how are we checking the children in? How are parents picking the children up? How are, how are we administrating this department? And, and, and we're trying to find the fit for it. Yeah. So we have to have people of capacity. Yeah, so the, not only do you guys have a spirit of excellence. When me and my wife were there, it was obvious there's a spirit of excellence. But you also have a great culture of honor. And I can't help but think it's because people uh, have owned why we do it. They understand this is why we do it, so they're excellent on how we do it. When you know the why, it's easier to go about the how. Yes. So what are the mindset shapers that you've developed that have been instilled in the culture of um, Cornerstone that bring such a wonderful experience of excellence and of honor? Well, because it can't be something you do. It has to be something you are. Um, either you are a person of honor or you're not, mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. If you have to make yourself honor somebody, you're not honorable. You're not an honor, a person of honor. So the why, the why is based on God. We, you do what you do as unto the Lord. So, so people are the beneficiary of your service, but God is the object of your service. And so you are doing, you are, you are watching children and, and working in the children's ministry as unto the Lord. Yeah. Because, because Jesus comes to us as the sick and the broken, the prisoner, the, the fatherless, the widows. He said, he said, when you do that to them, you do that to me. Yeah. Okay, so you got to pretend Jesus is in that room because he is. Yeah. And that you're, that you're stewarding the, the, the children the most valuable thing that Kathy and I ever possess in this world is our children. When they were coming up, they're still valuable to us, but they, they're, they're both married now and, and building their own lives as well. But I'm saying that was, that's our most valuable commodity. Mm-hmm. And for me to come to church and to put my children in your care, you know, I mean, so imagine how God feels about that. Yeah. So when you do that, you realize that people have entrusted you with something. You've been given a sacred trust for for. Every Sunday, I'm just telling you the things that I would tell some of our, our, our team over the yeah. years. Every Sunday, people come to my church that I have to be aware that every time I get up to preach, it's somebody's first time to ever hear anybody preach. Hmm. It's somebody's first time for a long time to ever hear somebody preach. It's somebody else's first time to ever hear me preach. Somebody else is, came that, that morning saying, God, if you, don't, if you don't say something to me today, I don't know what I'm going to do. Somebody the night before was going to take their own life yeah. and said, I'm going to give it one more go. Yeah. Somebody is hanging on by a thread. Yeah. You know, every week. You don't have the luxury of coming up in here as a leader and having a bad attitude day. <laughs> you can do that on Monday. You don't have that, you know, you, you don't have that luxury of, of walking past some mother who got a bad report from her seven-year-old teacher, and then the, the, then the child psychologist thinks that they got, you want to put them on every kind of medication known to man, and then they, they're failing in school, and her, her, the, the stepdad or the baby's daddy is causing problems, and they got to go to court, and she got told off by her supervisor, and she's bringing that, she's just hanging on by a thread, and she's walking that child into your classroom, and you got an attitude problem. Well, we, no, we can't do that. You have to be a person of honor. And you have to realize honor will bring out of that child something that the child psychologist can't bring out of it. Right. Uh, honoring that mother, sometimes the church is the only place that that woman has of honor. She has been told off on her job. The teachers think she's a poor mother. Her baby's daddy thinks she's, you know, whatever. Yeah. Everybody, but when she walks into that place of honor, and because she didn't have to have a title to be honored. She only, she only has to breathe to be honored. And so when you, when, you, when you surround people with honor, something stands up on the inside of them. Yeah, and it sounds like you, you help them form a story. Like mm. every face is a story. Yeah, absolutely. And if you, you treat them like a, a human being, you treat them with that they have a story, then that's really going to inform 
how you kind of go about and, and well, serve and the kingdom them. is a culture of life. Most most uh, evangelical Christians would agree that we are pro life. We are pro life, and we resist the concept of abortion because we believe that all life has value. Mm -hmm. So if all life has value, that that works outside of the womb as well. Yeah. <laughs> so that means that that you have value because you are God's. Yeah. Because you are breathing God's air, because you are created in the image of God. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I choose to, to try to find the image of God in every person that he has created. And, and then try to, if you nurture that and try to honor that, it will grow. Yeah. And, it will, and you have to believe that. You yeah. have to believe that because people, especially when you're in leadership and you deal with people, people can push every, every button you have. And you could think to yourself, you are not even anywhere close to being saved. Yeah. Right? Because mm -hmm. church people can act funny. And, and, they, can, and they, can, they can try you and they can test you. That's why you have to have it down in you. That this is not a hobby. This is not something I'm doing out of obligation. Yeah. This is something I'm doing because I believe that there is something in me that will get the best up out of you. Yeah. And the trajectory of your family will change because I said yes to what God gave me to do. That's so good. We were, we were talking a little bit about just, just cultural stuff and how we shape the cultures of our church. And you made a distinction between culture and structures, um, that there are structural things that are important. And from that structure, you fill it in with a culture. So what are some of the major teachings and concepts that are structure-related that you find yourself being redundant in for the purpose of people really having it in them and sticking out, especially if you want to create a vibrant, um, spirit-filled kingdom culture in your churches. What are some of those major pillars yep. or structures that you're saying, so honor is one, and what are some of the other ones that are in place that? Yeah, when, when, we to, when I would talk about structure and culture, it, it would mean to me that the structure is like the framework of a house or, or an empty house. It is the structure, and then the culture is how you decorate it. It's what's on the inside of that structure. So, um, so structure to me is the concept of order. It is, first of all, the belief that God moves through structure. Because to a lot of spirit-filled people, that, that's a leap. Right. You know, they believe that the more the spirit moves, the more unstructured it has to be. Mm -hmm. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches spirit and structure. So you have historically churches that had great structure but no spirit. Then you had spiritual churches that had no structure. And, but the unbeatable combination is spirit and structure. It's water that flows from a rock. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a rock with a flow. Yeah, yeah. And, That's good. and so it is, you have to believe that God flows through structure. And that structure does not inhibit the flow. Every, if you're going to have a river, it has banks. And the banks are the structure that cause the river to have a current. Otherwise, it's a pond. Or it's a lake. It, it doesn't have any flow because it doesn't have any structure pushing it in a direction. So that's, that to me is structure. Structure is the understanding of headship. Structure is the understanding of measures, mantles. It is, uh, is assignment. It is uh, degrees. It is greater and lesser. It is where things are placed. It is how they function. It is all of those things are structure. So, uh, and then the culture then becomes the things that you fill it with. You fill it with a culture of honor, a culture of faith. Yeah. A culture of gratitude, a culture of generosity, a, a, a culture of acceptance, a culture, whatever, you have great culture points here. And it's not just something you come up with. It's this is what we ascribe to. This is what we believe in. So we have a hard time sometimes in the church understanding measures and that, and that a kingdom is not a democracy and that a kingdom functions on assignment measures and we have this problem uh, in, in uh, democratic societies mm -hmm. with um, greater and lesser because we're really big into equality. Um, and I get it, please, as, as it relates to earthly governments. Mm -hmm. All men are created equal by God. I get all that. As it relates to assignments, they are not equal. Equality is Luciferian. Mm in its nature. I will be equal with God. Wow. Okay. So, so the concept of worship is I must understand something is higher than me. Mm. 
Other else, otherwise, I become my own God. When I become my own God, I determine my own good and evil. And having become my own God, I replace God. Mm. So, so, so the Bible is filled with this. Just track this for a minute. God, greater and lesser. God creates a greater light to rule the day. A lesser light to rule the, the evening. Mm -hmm. Okay? Of those born of women, there is none greater yeah. than John. Okay. So somebody's keeping track. <laughs> but the least in the kingdom right. is greater than John. Mm -hmm. That's good. Okay? Faith, hope, and love. Mm -hmm. But the greatest Come on. of these is love. Uh, yeah. All of these gifts. But behold, I show you a more excellent way. Mm. So we have a hard time in the church. Let every soul be subject to the higher power. Well, when you think you're on the same level as every power, then how can you be subject to anybody? So, so we, are, we are positionally equal, but functionally different. Mm. I still believe that the husband is the head of his house. Mm -hmm. Yes. Come on, Oprah. <laughs> Come. <laughs> Throw an amen out here someplace. I felt that Oprah spirit just <laughs> come at me. <laughs> so the husband is the head of his house. The husband does not, is not smarter than his wife. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible said the husband is the head. So that means my wife and I are positionally equal yeah. with God. Positionally equal, but functionally different. That's good. We, are fu our, our, we have different functions. Mm. And my children, in, when they're in my, we're in my house, they are positionally equal with God. They can pray the same prayer. God will hear their prayer and answer their prayer just like he would mine. But our function in our house is different. Right. So... Y'all are still working on that, I can see. But anyhow, oh, that's the way it works in the church, too. Let every soul be subject to the higher power. Yeah. So, so <laughs> the, the, here we go. The recognition, <laughs> the recognition and the ability to respond to authority is the sign that the kingdom is present. The, the man that Jesus said had the most faith was a man that understood authority. Yeah, he, watch how he says. He says, I am a man of authority because I am under authority. Here's how, here's how authority functions. I say to one, go, and he goes. Yeah. I say to another, come, and he comes. Jesus said, you understand this better than all these people that have been walking with me. Yeah. Okay, speak the word only. So, so if we believe the kingdom is present, here's what happens. If there is no demonstration of the kingdom, then, then the enemy doesn't have to listen. So if I say to an usher, come, and he doesn't come, and I say to an usher, go, and he doesn't go. The devil is sitting there going, you ain't casting me out. You don't even have authority over an usher. Hmm. And, you're going to, and now you're going to have the nerve to call somebody up with a demon and say, demon, go. The devil, if your ushers don't have to obey you, why do I have to obey you? <laughs> so, so, so the usher or anybody, I'm just giving examples of usher. So us submitting to the higher power is because of a greater, it's still because of God, because we want to physically demonstrate the principalities and powers that this is a kingdom over here. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, when, yeah. and when those of higher authority speak, things have to move. Yeah, yeah. And so yeah. If, if our leaders speak something, then things move because we want the devil to know the same guy that says, usher, go here, sing this song, don't do that, shut that down. That things move when words come out of his mouth. We want the devil to know that's the same way we approach it when he says sickness go. When he says heavens open. Yes. When he says yes. powers be broken. We yes. want you to know you do have to obey. I always enjoy our times of like round tables or question and answers because um, the Bible said counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water. And a man of understanding knows how to draw it out. And sometimes in answering questions, things begin to come forward that really help people in every aspect of their life. I really enjoyed my time in Philadelphia where Kathy and I were there with our friends, uh, Pastor Jamie and Virgie Centeno there at In The Light Church. Anyway, um, we're gonna go back right into that and I hope it's gonna be a blessing to you and uh, stay tuned.
I want to ask a thousand and one more questions. But here, here's one. Well, that's because I can't answer them shortly. Uh, I, guess, I, oh, got, I got a thing on me. Going. You really, you really teased with that and the measures and the order and all that stuff. But here, here's what I, what I'll ask you, totally off script, is what would it look like then? And I, I guess you gave you a teaser uh, of a church that has not functioning in that understanding or authority. Oh, it's that, chaos. That, that you could look at it and you could walk in as like they don't understand. It's chaos. Kingdom. It's chaos. Every man does what's right in his own eyes. Every person is self-governed and self-willed. Everyone has their own agenda. Everyone has their own word. Everyone is going their own direction. It's, it's, it's spasmatic. It's, it's a body that can't get in line with the head. Mm. It's paralyzed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the, it's the paralyzed servant. The head is working, but the body will not cooperate with the yeah, head. Yeah. And it's, it's, it is just it's just chaos. Give me some examples of like when you walk in. Have you walked into some of those churches? <laughs> oh, yes. And, and you're like, oh, this is, uh, they don't well, understand it's, the party. It's, it's filled with attitude of, of this fierce independence. And nobody's going to tell me what to do. And, I, and I don't, I'm not talking about being commanding and dictatorial with people. Because I ask people, and I've taught even my children, my family. We don't, I don't say to them, go tell an usher to do. I said, would you please go ask brother so-and-so to do this? But they know that, you know, it's, it's, it's a for real ask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, you still are polite about it and kind. It's not like telling people what to do. Right. But people who are disempowered don't like having authority over them because they think that somehow it reduces them to be answerable to another person. Mm -hmm. When people have no authority, they don't know how to respond to authority. Right. So, so the centurion was able to recognize authority in Jesus because he was a man of authority himself. The hardest people to pastor are broke down, beat up people who have never been in charge of anything because since they don't have any authority, it's hard for them to recognize my authority. Right. Because if you never had authority, you would understand that being in authority is a great responsibility. And how would you ever run something had somebody put you up here? Yeah. But when you ain't never done nothing but sit around and complain <laughs> about everybody else in authority, mm. and you don't ever see yourself as moving towards authority, it's hard for you to recognize somebody else's authority. Mm, yeah. So, so it becomes difficult for them to move into leadership. Um, here's a natural example, and I'll give you a biblical example. Natural example was when our daughter, Meredith, who's 27 now, but when she was um, like... I think it was like four or five years old. We had a little dog. It was the only thing on the planet she was in charge of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I, re I remember walking in, w walking in there one day, and she had that dog, and she was looking at that dog. She said, you will sit down. Sit when I tell you. To. You know, she was just like yeah, four yeah. or five years old. She was like commanding this dog. And I thought, like, who is this child? Because Meredith is a sweet child. She was just going. And then I realized it's the only thing on the planet she has authority over. <laughs> Are you working that in your brain? <laughs> have you seen that person? <laughs> they don't have, they've never had authority over anything, and you give them one little thing, and they turn into a monster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because it's the, one, it's the only thing they have authority over mm. on the planet. So, so the children of Israel come out of Egypt, and uh, Moses is called to be their deliverer. He's their pastor. And they say to him, oh, so who made you? A ruler over us. Well, I don't know, God. <laughs> Ten plagues, yeah, miracles. Yeah. Uh -huh. Remember the sea? But they're still mad. Because they had been abused by previous authority, they resisted godly authority. Mm, that's good. Because their idea of authority was formulated by Pharaoh. Mm. And, so, and so many of us have, have poor, poor relationships or context or reference points with authority. And therefore, we don't understand that authority is not there to constrict you. It is there to release you. Yeah. So that what you do is legitimate. I'm, good, I'm just kind of segueing here. Okay. Because, um, because one of the problems we have in, in the culture today is a lack of legitimacy. People don't know what is legitimate. Mm. So, so we just have people that up and make themselves something. Mm-hmm. They just stick it on their Facebook page. I'm prophet so-and-so. Mm -hmm. Well, who made you a prophet? Right. Who said you was a prophet? What makes you legitimate? Mm. So when there's the loss of legitimacy in a culture 
And it goes all the way through culture. So <laughs> we have illegitimate churches. Mm. We have people that just want to live together and never get married. Right. And say, oh, well, it's just a piece of paper. Well, yeah, so is your driver's license. <laughs> I don't even know what that argument means. It's just a piece of paper. <laughs> so is a hundred dollar bill. <laughs> you know, it, it's the concept of legitimacy. And, and then people don't know what's legitimate. And so then we celebrate illegitimacy. Mm. And so in, in, in our, our members are, and when you have a culture of illegitimacy, you are at such risk to be scammed. Right. And to be taken advantage of. Because we have... What our members don't know is that there are people in doctoral programs who are atheists, whose doctoral studies are on how stupid and gullible people who believe in God are. And part of the way they're proving it is they go create a fake Facebook profile, call themselves a prophet, start throwing out their little fortune cookie. They just open fortune cookies and, mm -hmm. you know, Prophecies. great things are coming your way today. Hallelujah. And then... <laughs> And then they get a few thousand followers on Facebook, preach prophet, preach prophet. That's my word, prophet. <laughs> and they're doing a doctoral study, and you are proving their point. Because you don't know those people. They're not even, they're not even saved. No. And so we've, we've lost our concept. I know I'm going to upset somebody, but I'm getting on an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> somebody go start the car. Where's the security ministry in this church? <laughs> We're going right through the back. <laughs> Watch out for me, brother, okay? So, so here's the point, and you got to hear my heart on this because I don't have rocks to throw at people. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to get our, a framework here. Yeah. I think there's something wrong when, when we have people that don't know how to, to be silent, and being a Christian is not me agreeing with you on everything. So here's what happens. We have uh, 14, 15-year-old girls in our churches getting pregnant. Okay? Happens sometimes. I'm not about shaming people. But they will go home and pull their shirt up and put a picture of your 15-year-old pregnant belly on Facebook. And the people in the church will go, congratulations. For what? Mm. I feel you. You don't even have to clap. For what? You did, you're not returning home from a You have done nothing of merit. Mm. Okay, so, so there should be a place between shame and celebration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. That place is called discretion. Yeah. Mm. You should be discreet about it. We're not trying to shame you. We're not trying to shame your family. When the baby shows up, I will be the first to throw it a shower. And by, I ain't throwing you no shower. Mm. That's why the other girls want to get pregnant. How come we can't throw a shower for the ones that are, that are doing it properly? Yeah. Because we have lost the concept of what is legitimate. Yeah. And you want us to treat, we, you want us to throw you a party. Mm -hmm. I will throw the baby a, I ain't throwing you no party. <laughs> For what? That's good. I'm just saying, this is what happens when we lose the concept of legitimacy. Yeah. And again, it happens in our church like it does everybody else's. And, and I'm not about shaming people. I, don't, I, want, I want them to be loved and embraced. I want them to understand people make mistakes and all those kind of things. But you, you should not reward illegitimacy. Yeah. yeah. And it's not the child is not illegitimate. The parents are. Yeah. There's an illegitimate father running around out there. And, and a mother got, you know, whatever brought the situation on. My point is is that when we celebrate illegitimacy, and I don't know why that is with church people that will see that and go like, congratulations, oh, awesome, praise the Lord, and you throw your little prophecy on there, just, you know, we act like we don't have any sense. Mm. Mm. So when you lose legitimacy, it happens the same. We have, we have people that split other people's churches, run down the road, and paint on the apostle so-and-so, and we got people, oh, just praise the Lord, brother, you know, whatever. <laughs> we have no concept of what is legitimate. Right. So... Great legitimate leaders are at times, I, I think about... Are you going to edit that last segment out? What's that? Are you going to edit that last I segment don't know. out? Let it play? We're going to give it to you. You, you determine from there. <laughs> Address all of your emails to In The Light Church. <laughs> Pastor Jamie Pastor Centeno Jamie will knows. personally answer every one of them. 
So, so great, legitimate leaders. I think about people like Walt Disney and um, Steve Jobs, people who have done amazing things, uh, but a lot of us kind of celebrate them and what they've achieved, but don't realize that some of them had some blemishes in their leadership style and the sure. way they came across. Sure. Uh, yet, they were legitimate leaders that created innovative products and ideas that just kind of changed our world. I, I say that because have we become a culture of people that are hypersensitive in, in terms of when leaders do something that they might not agree with or have done it like, are we a real hypersensitive that I'm not going to follow that? Or are we too tolerant? that we're willing to Follow allow anything. anything to happen and, and just keep going with it. Awesome. Great question, because I think those are the tensions. I think most things exist in a tension. Most things are not either or. Most things are both and. Most things are somewhere an amalgamation of two opposing viewpoints. Mm -hmm. so, so just to explore those two viewpoints, we become hypersensitive because we like to use uh, the fact that we are filled with the spirit to baptize our self-will and independence and rebellion. And so whenever we don't want to do something, we say, I, I got a check in my spirit. You know, <laughs> I don't feel good about it. You know, what is that supposed to Because that's a subjective thing that nobody, when you mean, we're talking about you got a check in your spirit. Only check I want to see is the one in the offering plate. Thank you. That's the, <laughs> that's the problem. Your checks are always in your spirit. Your spirit, yeah. <laughs> we need to get them checks to manifest. <laughs> And um, I don't feel good on it. I don't have a piece about it. You know, I, you know, I don't have a witness on that. You know, we use all that nomenclature, and there, and which really diminishes the true fact of discernment. You know, when you just throw it out there all the time, you know, everything is I don't feel good. I don't have a piece about it. I got to check in my spirit. I don't know. God ain't said that to me. That ain't my gift. That ain't my season. I'm, I'm not, that ain't what God called me to do. I don't know. You start throwing all that stuff out yeah. there. Then, it, then when you say it, you, you desensitize yourself to the truth of it. Yeah. So, so that's how we become hypersensitive. Anything that we don't get right away, somehow we put God's name on. Mm. Rather than saying to myself, this is, this is going to be a learning curve. Right. Um, th this, this is not a test of him being a father. This is a test of whether or not I'm a son. Mm. This, this, the, the test is on me to see if I, can, if, 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 if I can walk around the city and not know why. Um, this is a test of... God didn't say it to me, but he said it to leadership. The Apostle Paul said, and the Lord said to me, do this. And so we went. Mm, yeah. God yeah. didn't say it to them. So, so that's how we become hypersensitive. On the other hand, getting back to the illegitimacy is, is the fact that pe some people will, will, will follow anything. And, um, and I believe that it's important for us all to understand that leaders are human beings as well. And human beings uh, and leaders have flaws and our works in progress and that we should not put upon leaders standards that we don't even have for ourselves. And because, because you're a human being, I'm a human being, um, I'm anointed to preach it, I'm not anointed to live it. I have to live it out like everybody else does, step by step, fleshing it out, pushing, mm -hmm. crucifying the flesh, casting down imaginations, pushing, you know, just like everybody else does. But on the other hand, we have people that are just flat out in the ozone mm -hmm. and have lost their mind and are publicly living in sin and just have cast away all restraint. And people are just like, they just come up with a whole other set of, set of values mm -hmm. to justify it. Mm -hmm. So... I think, I think somewhere in the middle, we have to say, the Apostle Paul said it the best way, follow me as I follow Christ. You know, so you're following Christ, your heart is right, you're pursuing God, you're doing that. doesn't mean that everything, every decision that you make has to be perfect the first time, but you should be able to expect your leaders to follow you because they know your heart is to pursue Christ. Yeah. If, you're, if your heart becomes or, or was to pursue money or to pursue women or to pursue some ungodly something, I don't have to follow you. Right. Because then it becomes a blind leader of the blind, and the destination right. is always the ditch. Yeah, that's good. Now, there's a word that I'm going to be getting from, 
from your church that I really want to give to the leaders. And it had to do with your conference when you talked about quantum wealth. And it was just dynamic, and it was much more than just the idea of wealth. It was, it was bigger than that. It was the idea of poverty versus materialism versus kingdom and all these other factors involved. It was dynamic, and I think it's a, even a now word for our church. Uh, in there, you say that the warfare that, uh, or opposition that surrounds certain things, I believe it was a deliverer, uh, inheritance and property land. and land, and acquiring territory is one of those things, that opposition. So, yeah, share a little bit about that. There's always warfare around certain things. Whenever, whenever there's warfare around something, you know it's important. Anything of value has to be protected. So if, if, you, if you walk, start walking towards certain buildings and they got a bunch of security guards around, a bunch of security, it's, something, it's something valuable in there. Right. So, um, so anytime the enemy puts warfare around something, that means the closer you get to it and the more intense the warfare becomes, the more valuable it is and the more destructive it is to his kingdom if you get a hold of it. So there's, there's always been warfare around um, property, who possesses the land? Uh, because that, that's always been the promise of God. You read through the Old Testament, there's never a promise of going to heaven for serving God. <laughs> you do go to heaven. Lord have mercy. Okay, come on. <laughs> you do go to heaven if you serve God, but, that, but they didn't serve God to go to heaven. That's what somebody taught you to do when you were a kid or something. I don't know. Yeah. But the, the promise of serving God was that you inherited the land. So your seed shall possess the land. That's the promise. Yeah, yeah. The meek do inherit the earth. Why is it so important that we, is we get don't territory want it. I or see, land? I can see what, what? Why is it so important that we get territory and land? Because there's some people. Because it's the Lord's. Right. And the devil is illegally occupying it. And then, and then when you have that territory, then you have there, authority over it. Yeah. And you can develop culture. Yeah. The, the, ki the kingdom starts in a garden and ends in a city. Mm. God is, God is the author of culture. So our, our, our problem is we think that culture belongs to the devil. There are people that believe that if man had never sinned, we'd still be in a garden naked. Like God would not have a new idea. Like we would never have developed electricity. Thank God the devil got involved because now we got electricity. If it had been left up to God, we'd still be eating coconuts naked in a garden. Are you kidding me? God is the originator of culture. God is the originator of art. God, God is the originator of inventions and creativity. I don't know why we gave all this credit to the devil. Mm. So that's what they believe. Right. So, so because of this crazy, you know, we're out of here, clicking our heels together over the rainbow, whatever thing that people came up with, mm -hmm. we have been willing to abdicate the earth over to the devil, and then we complain the whole time that the devil has, is running around on the earth. That's because you don't want it. You don't, have the, you don't have the legitimate right to have authority over a community unless you're willing to marry the land. So this, this, this is what the Bible says. The Bible says, as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons be married unto thee. Thy name shall be called Beulah and Hesphalah, which means beautiful and married. Mm. Okay, so, if, but we have people, they're not willing to marry the land. If you're not willing to marry the land, you don't have the legitimate right to sow seed into it. Mm. So, so when you marry the land, that means I'm not dating the land. And then plan on getting up out of here. Right. Mm. This thing is till death do us part. Right. Till Jesus comes back. So, so you marry the land. Right. Therefore, I can legitimately sow seed into it and reproduce children of the kingdom because I'm married to it. Mm. So, so I, I can and get the away. enemy opposes that. The, the enemy, enemy opposes like, that. That's, I, that's why the enemy comes up with these ideas like he did with Eve. Oh, God ain't said that. What God said is, I got you a mansion somewhere, someplace. Go over there. Go over there and look so you don't marry this right here. The, answer, the proof of your citizenship in the kingdom is not your ability to go find something. It's your ability to summon something and say, that kingdom, come right here. Mm. Not my ability to get up and go find it someplace else. So... So if I get started on that, I'm, well, you're going to get some more emails. <laughs> because, because I get tired of this someday later, 
Let's get up out of here. Let's turn it over to the devil. And then we wonder why the enemy has, the enemy will occupy every space that the church abdicates. And when, and when you think you're leaving tomorrow, then that's why the enemy has the school districts and the politicians and the entertainment because you, you refuse to put your feet down and say the earth is the Lord's. I used to hear people say that Adam gave the earth over to the devil. You can't give what's not yours. The only thing Adam lost was authority and dominion. Yeah. He did not yeah. lose the planet. Yeah, yeah. And when Jesus came, he came to restore the dominion and the authority, but the earth was always the Lord's and the fullness thereof and they that dwell therein. Mm. So if the meek are going to inherit the earth, that means it has to be here. You need to come out of this apocalyptic, end time, broke down... Half the people say, oh, you see all this stuff on the news? It must be the end times. We just have better news now. Mm. <laughs> you just are more aware of it. There's always been earthquakes. There's always been wars. You just didn't know about it because we only had the 24-hour news cycle since Ted Turner invented CNN. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, they're cutting people's heads off. Mm. Well, have you read the Old Testament? <laughs> They've been cutting people's heads off for a long time. And they've been doing it all over, all over the Middle East for a long time. We just didn't have cameras there. Yeah. Wow. And it's just now happening to the media people. That's why it's being covered. Mm, yeah. Because the media people are saying, now they're cutting our heads off. <laughs> yeah. we got to report this. As <laughs> long as they're cutting Christians' heads off, nobody cares. That's right. They've been doing that for a while. As yeah. long as they're cutting women's heads off or having adultery... Under Sharia law, nobody says anything. As long as they cut thieves' hands off, ain't nobody saying nothing. Now they're coming after reporters. We better report on it. Mm, right. so, so that's that. Okay. So, so then they say, well, you know, we got people dying of Ebola. And I'm not making light of it because we, we need to get on this because this is, this is a deal. But, but, but I'm talking about attaching it to some kind of crazy end time something. It must be the end times. It's Ebola. It's plagues. Do you realize that a third of Europe died of the bubonic plague? A third of Europe. What's the population of America? 500 million? 600 million? What's a third of that? I didn't go to math class. 200 million. We got five or six people in America, and it's on the news 24-7. Five or six people with Ebola. Can you imagine if, how much did you say? If 200 million people had something, that's what happened during the bubonic plague. Right. Mm -hmm. We call this the end time. Well, that's because <laughs> we didn't have cameras and news going on all right, back then. Right. Anyway. <laughs> Well, I I'm, know I'm, I'm just I'm just filibustering. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, you, I, I want you to talk about this because even in the part about the land, you talked about how there's zoning things yep. in and there's zoning things out. This is how it manifests. Yeah. In America, our demons have been to school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, so our demons, like if you go to some countries, you can spot demons because they're witch doctors and, and voodoo people and all that. In America, our doctors wear suits and ties, have corner offices, and they've been to college. Mm. Mm. And so, so our, our demons function in line with the system. So, so, so... Uh, so the warfare is around zoning laws. It's around uh, regulations. Um, so the the so if you if you put the land and the media together, there's always there's always warfare around media. Yeah. Because it controls culture. Yeah. So it it is it is a modern day manifestation of the spirit of Jezebel. Jezebel got yeah. stirred up because she wanted Naboth's vineyard yeah. property. And her point was trying to silence the prophetic voice. And so those two things combined now manifest themselves in zoning laws where they will tell a church, you can't be zoned here. We want Naboth's Vineyard. You have to go way out there someplace else. So if it's something that they want, whether it's a stadium or an X-rated movie theater or whatever it is, they find a way to zone it in. Yeah. But when a church wants to build, then they're, all of a sudden it's like, well, you know. And in California and certain states, it has crept up on people so quickly. Where I, I know people that were building churches and the city council tell them, we don't need a church that big in this county. Mm. 
and just tell them, we're not going to give you that property because we don't want a church that big. And it's, it turns into traffic, you know, it's too much traffic on this road. When we, when we were getting the church building that we were in, we had to do traffic studies for the, for the city because they were like, we had a baseball stadium. What was it, Kathy, a mile from the church, two miles? A mile from our church, there was a baseball stadium, but they're concerned about the traffic of my church. So I had to do, I had to do traffic studies. So finally I said to them, everybody in my church lives in this town, which means they pay taxes. So we can drive on any road that we want to whenever we, we get ready to. Why do they have to have a special permit? or dispensation from you to drive on the streets that they paid for. So, so it's becomes, it becomes zoning. It becomes media. Churches are the only people that produce programs and then pay themselves to be on. <laughs> Why do we got to pay to be on? Mm. Everybody else is getting paid to be on. Right. We have to buy. That's why we got things like our own internet channels and stuff. Yeah. A little plug for CornerstoneGlobal.tv. Yeah. And we have our own, <laughs> we have our own internet channels and things like that that are going on because there's warfare around it. That's right. That there's always been an uneasy relationship between the media and the church. Yeah. And the airwaves. The airwaves. Who controls the prin the principality and power of the air? Who controls the airwaves? And um, it's very interesting that you see, if you, if you just track through history, I'm looking at our clock there, so I'm, I'm trying, not, yeah, to, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to worry you out. <laughs> but, um, but it's interesting that if you track through history, whatever the media attacks, it turns around back at them. Okay? So Billy Graham's crusades took off because uh, William Randolph Hearst owned the newspapers, yeah. and he was affected by Billy Graham, and he sent a one-word thing to his people, said, Puff Graham. Billy Graham was doing a tent meeting in, in uh, I think it was L.A., and he said, Puff Graham. So all of his newspapers did a nice story on Billy Graham. His crusades went from tents to stadiums overnight, power of the media. But because they build one up, they could tear another one down, so, so they did, wrote negative things about Oral Roberts. Because mm -hmm. if I want to tear one person down, i got to build another person up so mm -hmm. it doesn't look like I'm anti-religious. Oral Roberts and, and Billy Graham were good friends. William Randolph Hearst did this thing about uh, Amy Simple McPherson because um, it, it, she said she was kidnapped for a few days. I don't know if you guys remember this. She said she was kidnapped. This is way back. And said she was kidnapped, blah, blah, blah. And it, nobody ever really quite got to the bottom of it, you know, kind of a thing. But whatever. That's what, so, but they did this terrible story trying to discredit her. She's the founder of Angelus Temple, you know, mm -hmm. and which with the Foursquare and all that came out right. of. And she was a powerful wor woman, but whatever happened to that little episode, nobody knew. But he, he sowed that at her. Fast forward. His granddaughter was with the PLO, Patty Hearst. She said she was kidnapped. The same thing that they, they, they sowed in that direction came back on them. Okay, let me, let me bring it contemporary to you. We, we had a football player, uh, Tebow, who would get down on his knees and pray. And they had a fit. They had a fit. They had a fit. Now they having a fit in the NFL. Now you having a fit. Mm. Now you having a fit. Oh yeah. Because yeah. them, them boys ain't ain't praying now. They smacking folks. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. So so you have to remember that what I have watched them go after preachers and that thing sp spin around and the next season is your politicians. Mm, yeah. So so God defends all that, but. So, but there's always an uneasy relationship around, around property. Yeah. Who, who possesses the land? Who possesses the land? Media, culture, advertisement, and entertainment. Delivers. And delivers. And delivers. Whenever delivers are born, there's warfare. Moses was getting ready to be born, and the warfare came to wipe out a whole generation. Yeah. Same thing happened when Jesus was getting ready to be born. When Jesus is getting ready to be born, whenever deliverance is coming forward, there's an attack on an entire generation. Yeah, yeah. And so the fact that we see this, 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 this almost cheering for abortion um, tells me that deliverers are being born. Yeah, yeah. Or else the enemy wouldn't be fighting to, to snuff out lives so, so quickly and so yeah. easily. There's always warfare around the transference of wealth. Yep. Whenever wealth is about to be ready to be transferred, there's warfare around that. And the body of Christ has to get their faith around that. 
that we are called. We are the teachers and the world is the student. Yeah, yeah. Jesus said, go and teach all nations and disciple them. We are the teachers. Mm. The world is the student. So teach us on this. I, I'm sure a lot of things have come your way, interesting things. Um, and I, 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 interesting scenario. Uh, it's been resolved, but it was somebody uh, had recently shared with us that um, their tithe, uh, they wanted to give their tithe to a place that was in need. And, uh, and so it was legitimate. There was a place in need and understood their tithe as being something that they can give wherever they would like to give instead of bringing their tithe into the storehouse, bringing their tithe in the house. That's called being so that? Yes, I've heard of it. It's called I don't want to be accountable. It's called I can't check up on that. It's called, it, it, it's called I want to eat at this restaurant and pay a bill over here. It, it's, it's, it's just, I don't even know where to start with those kind of people because I don't even take them seriously. It's like these people that want to tell me, tithing is in the Old Testament. My brain starts melting <laughs> because it's so ignorant mm -hmm. for you to say something like that. Like anything in the Old Testament, we don't believe. Okay, well, here's one that's in the Old Testament. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's in the Old Testament. This corporate Christ that you talked about last night, you referred to, was there anything that you left out that you would like to... Just, I, I love the idea, and God's been speaking to us in, based on kind of unity, oneness, being able to do something together. And I love how you talked about all doors open, yep. uh, to uh, even people that are just around uh, the corporate Christ setting. So, yeah, what, what, what does that look like uh, to you as you project in the future? Because we almost believe that, that the revival is going to be that corporate Christ type Absolutely. of movement. Well, the, God deals with us based on the state that he finds us and who we're aligned with. So if we are in a state of corruption, his work is to save us. If we are saved, then he builds covenant with us. And if we are in covenant with him, then he wants us to become part of the body, the community, something I would just call it the community. Jesus came to build a new ethnos. It's where we get the word ethnic group from. You are a holy nation is the word ethnos. You are a holy nation. He has called us out of every tribe, kindred, and tongue. We're forever trying to pull God into our tribe, kindred, and tongue. God made us how he made us on purpose. Red, yellow, black, white, shades in between, all of the different things. God made you the way he made you on purpose. He made you that to help fulfill your destiny, for you to bring some special herbs and spices to the kingdom so that it's not all the same thing. So it is not the loss of identity but it is not the exaltation of individuality. Where there is the exaltation of the individual, people become aggrandizing. Where there is aggrandizement and self-seeking, there is, there is insult. And where there's insult, there's rudeness. And where there's rudeness, there's injury. Where there's injury, there's offense. Where there's offense, there's division. Where there can be no more us because it is always about me. So at some point, Jesus says, I'm treating you, and there are some blessings that we have claimed individually that only belong to the corporate body. The transfer of wealth does not belong to you. It belongs yeah. to the body. Yes, yes. And it, it, there, there are things that, that, that he, when, when he talks to them about the tithe in Malachi, he said, you've robbed me this whole nation. So he dealt with them as a nation. There had to be somebody paying their tithe, but he judged them based on who they were aligned with and dealt with them based on as a group. Yeah. So you, you have the story of Achan. Jericho was taken because it's the first city. God said, the first is mine. Mm -hmm. And everybody did right but Achan and his family. Mm. And God said, y'all, Israel cannot win their battle <laughs> because we can't get these, these people are destroying the corporate Christ. They are breaking rank and breaking unity. When everybody God so values the unity, and it happens so few times in the Bible that he actually said, you know what, it's better. Let's just get rid of these jokers. Mm. Ananias and Sapphira. Y'all ain't saying amen now, but mm. anyhow. And, <laughs> and these, these are not Sunday morning church growth messages. But, <laughs> but the point is, and the point is that there's a lot of questions that it may uh, engender that could be answered. But the, the point is that unity is so, and oneness is so scarce throughout the scripture, that any time it shows up, 
something big happens. Yeah. That wow. that at some point God said we very every every so often we get this. Mm-hmm. And now I'm going to let Ananias and Sapphira mess it up. You know, mm. we'll just sort that out later. <laughs> you know, Achan and his family, we'll we'll deal with that down the road. Mm. So even when, it's, even when it's not uh, people that are doing what God wants them to do. They're building the Tower of Babel. And God said, the people are of one speech. Nothing is impossible to them. So the purpose of division is limitation. Yeah. God divided their languages to limit them. <laughs> hmm. so, the, so the enemy knows that the purpose of division is limitation. Because when we become as one, we are not limited. Oh. So sometimes we have to lay down our agendas we have to prefer our brothers. The weak have to bear the infirmities. The strong have to bear the infirmities of the weak. We have to pray for one another that we may be healed, that God turns our captivities when we pray for our friends, that God puts our answer in somebody else to keep us moving together. Yeah. So he gives to one this gift, to another this gift, to another this gift, and gives none of us all the gifts so that it keeps us moving together and being interdependent rather than codependent so that we realize, I don't have it all together, but together we have it all. Amen. What a great way to conclude this time as you, yeah, what a blessing. You can tell that there's such a richness to uh, Bishop and his, uh, his wife, uh, Pastor Kathy, and the fact that they've been able to impart so richly to us. I believe they just have such a strong voice and sound and message and I feel so honored that they would be uh, able to be here with us and impart that richness. Um, and I, I just, uh, we're, we're glad to be partners with them. We're glad to, to, to hear what they have to say. Uh, we are, I don't know, uh, you don't call it fans, but we just uh, find ourselves as uh, just really connected in a deep way to what's happening. You, it, it's rare nowadays. Some, sometimes you, you can hear... Um, similar things in, in circles, and, and that's fine, but uh, the rhema word of God and, and the way that it's being presented, uh, I think Bishop Pitts is definitely in there as one of those guys, and each of those things he's mentioned with um, the, the order of the house and authority and all those things have been practiced in his life, and that's why, what you hear. What, that's what you hear. You hear and you see the structure and the culture of how he lives and what he believes and it comes forth in the insights that he brings. And so, uh, once again, thank you, Bishop and well, listen, Kathy. I know that you want to. You should have the last word in the amen. I just, I just want to take a moment on behalf of Kathy and I to thank you guys for your hospitality and your openness. And this is your group of volunteers and leaders and department heads and friends and people that I call sometimes the engine of the church. Mm-hmm. When Jesus turned the water into wine, the Bible said nobody knew how he did it, but those that drew it out did. And there are people that come to a church and never know how it happens. And they're always amazed. But the people that helped to make the wine know where it came from. And there are people that walk into a church and don't know where the anointing came from, don't know how. They're always baffled. Like, how in the world did they do that? Well, these people know because you helped to make the anointing in the house. And you helped to give of your life and your time to do that. And um, you guys are uh, awesome And everything that goes on here has that vibe of excellence and forward thinking and pressing into it. And I just want to say, you guys are on such a great track. Your future is so bright. Here's the thing. If you guys can stay together, if you guys can be quick to forgive, if you guys can absorb each other's humanity and realize that the kingdom is filled with a bunch of colorful people that are trips, and Jesus loves us with our trippy selves, and if we can just get past, you know, the little things and realize that any time there's that friction or that division or that thing that rises up in us, that's the enemy trying to, trying to cut a hand off the body. And that we refuse, to, we refuse to break because what God wants to do in this territory is greater than just our little individual opinions and feelings about it. And just to thank you guys for, for all of that and knowing that that comes from two great pastors and, and their pastoral team. But it, it comes from Pastor Jamie and Pastor Virgie and Virgie, and, and we love you guys, and we're really for you. And so just kind of help, help us on our end. Sorry about that. <laughs> and uh, 
just kind of help us on our end because what, what we did here today, we're probably going to put on our, um, our internet channel. And I'm just trying to get some people to help us push it because I think, and there's something, I'm still, I'm still not there with the whole way that we're creating it. We were talking some about it, but I have a vision that I'm, I'm kind of walking in that direction that I think is going to really make a difference. And um, just kind of help us push that a little bit, cornerstoneglobal.tv, or just check it out sometime. And we're going to put something like this on there, maybe the unedited version. <laughs> maybe. And then the whole time it's up, I'm just going to put your personal phone number. <laughs> All comments will be personally responded to, Pastor uh, Jamie Centeno. Well, and, uh, forward in anyway, uh, anyway, God bless you guys. Thank you so much, and you have the last word. But we, we, we love coming here, and thank you guys so much for receiving us. God bless you. Thank you. Yes, awesome. Let me pray you guys out. Why don't you stand to your feet? Lord, we thank you for such a rich and valuable time. We bless you, Lord God. We thank you for the insight that you've imparted. We thank you for this man and woman of God who are doing a tremendous global work, Lord God, and have a wonderful local expression. We just pray for quantum things to happen in this year and in beyond, Lord God, and all the things that you've put in his heart, Lord God. We pray for it to manifest in this season. And we just bless this body and these wonderful leaders and people who sacrificed their time, but it's for a kingdom work that's well worth it, Lord God, that we will see heaven come to earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.